Greetings all, welcome to the Upper Room Gathering online forums. I'm David Martin, president of the Upper Room Gathering. It's a pleasure to have all of you here or listening to the recording on YouTube. Today, we welcome back Dr. Paul Vitz. It's always a pleasure for me to talk with Paul. Today, uh, Paul will present dealing with hatred with people who don't want to forgive. I hope that it'll be an engaging topic and provide an opportunity for family communications to open and to be and to foster deeper, more intimate relationships. Your presence here is a great blessing, and I'd like to start in prayer. Precious Lord, this is the time of year where we face the manger with joy and expectation. We thank you for family, for Mary, who accepted your invitation with grace and love, and for Joseph, who accepted his role as husband and stepfather, we give you praise. We pray for the wisdom that guided the shepherds and magi to the Christ child. We pray, we praise you who gave your only son, who sent your spirit, bringing us the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Well, Paul Vitz uh, it brings a unique Christian focus to psychology. Dr. Vitz's teaching and research focus is the integration of Christian theology, especially Catholic anthropology. His methods require us breaking from the modern secularism and postmodern relativism prevalent today. He's present, presently also addressing the following topics, the psychology of hatred and forgiveness, the psychological importance of fathers and the relevance of psychology for understanding atheism and psychology of the virtues. He's an author with two colleagues uh, of a Catholic Christian meta model of the person integration of psychology and mental health practice. I'm happy to also to welcome Paul Vitz. Uh, before we begin, please be aware that today's presentation deals with a topic such as hate, unforgiveness and estrangement. These topics may be difficult for some. If you feel unease or stress, contact your local church or parish. But now let me uh, get to um, sort of a discussion of what hatred is. I want to distinguish between hatred and anger. For, first of all, anger is a natural response that most people have to when they're being attacked or threatened. And to be angry when that happens is not sinful and is perfectly normal. Apparently we have to have some response to threat and just for survival purposes. So there's anger and I, particularly immediate anger. And that's not a sin, that's natural when somebody is threatening, harming, insulting you. But there's an, the, but hatred is not anger. Hatred is cultivated anger. Hatred is the anger that you let, you didn't, you know, scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, and it says, you know, be angry, but sin not. And those are two examples from scripture. So it isn't saying you can't be angry. But it says, don't let the sun go down on it. And what does that mean? It means don't cultivate it. If you let the sun go down on your anger, you're holding on to it. We were talking about the difference between anger and hatred, which is cultivated anger. In addition, when you cultivate your anger, you get us, I mean, and into hatred. You will develop secondary forms of anger that are created by your cultivation. So it's that issue that we're addressing. You hate somebody, you've cultivated your anger, and it's, in addition, you've gotten secondary anger, which is the result of your cultivation. Now, who might these people be? Uh, they're people you know. Well, very commonly, they're members of your family or relatives of some kind. And this is a serious issue. So we want to address the nature of that anger especially in the form of hatred, interpersonal hatred. And here I want to take a little sideline into some psychological theory, which I think will be helpful. Um, the idea comes originally came 
from work of Melanie Klein and others. But what it is, it's, we want to propose how hatred begins. And the idea is that when the infant is born, it has internalized, it, it, it develops or has innately, it has an internal representation of the mother. And the mother is internalized in two ways, as a good mother and the bad mother. And these two mothers are separate, completely unrelated to each other in the mind of the infant. And the reason for this presumably is because in the early developing nervous system, positive events and negative events are kept in a different location. And then as the infant's mind and life develops, eventually those two good and bad mothers are put together. So let me explain first, the good mother and the bad mother mean that the mother is split. And this is called splitting when you split a person and you start by splitting your mother or the mother in one into the good mother and the bad mother. Second, the infant develops the notion of their self from the interaction with the mother. I'm good, the infant thinks or constructs when the mother is good to, to the infant. I'm good, myself is good. And when the mother is bad, to me, that means I'm bad. So we have both a split in the mother, the good mother and the bad mother. We have a split in the self, the good self and the bad self. And this develops over the next few months. And then eventually in the normal case, the two are integrated. And suddenly the infant becomes aware that there is the same person who is the good mother and the bad mother. And what this does is it creates in the infant a kind of sadness and remorse. I call it a proto sense of guilt. All of us would recognize that if we had somebody we really liked and inadvertently in another situation, we had been very hostile to them, not knowing. When you put it together, you would feel guilty about it. Even though you don't need to feel guilty because you didn't do it by a will choice. You didn't choose to be hostile to them. You didn't think it was them. So the proto guilt, which is set up in the infant when the integration of the good mother and the bad mother comes together, when that integration takes place, the splitting is supposedly overcome and it's integrated. The child feels a little bit of remorse, may even be reach out to try to comfort the mother and make up for the bad images and dreams and fantasies it's had. But the child has made a major interpersonal uh, accomplishment. And um, one of the things the child does, it's called repair, reparation to the mother after the integration has been put in place. Now, some individuals never overcome the good mother and bad mother splitting. And this can lead to long-term pathologies. I don't want to go into it. It's one explanation for possibilities of people like borderlines. It means, in fact, they're not incapable. They never developed a good proto-guilt, a proto-remorse, and it may mean they're incapable later in life of true guilt. But that's a separate issue. And we're, we're not talking about those people anymore. We're talking about the normal case in which the infant integrates the split between the good and the bad mother. <clears throat> and at the same time, <clears throat> they are integrating the split between the good and the bad self. <clears throat> Excuse me, you understand why they're doing it. Because the integration of the mother means the self gets integrated. And what is the major accomplishment of this? Big. First of all, you now recognize that people are both good and bad, starting with the primary person in your life, the mother or the mothering figure. And second, you're coming to the conclusion that you're made up of both good and bad. Major insight or major understanding. 
And so once this happens, when it happens, people debate whether it happens when the infant is around five or six months, or maybe whether it continues and doesn't really solidify itself until maybe two years. But in any case, that is a major accomplishment. And it means that splitting has been overcome. Now, how do we know that splitting exists in infants and in children? You know, they don't tell us. <laughs> what are you psychologists doing here, making up another, another illusion for us or a fib or whatever? No. Um, there's a lot of evidence that comes some of it from various places. Three sources of evidence. One, when children of four, five, or six do, sometimes do get into psychotherapy or into a psychoanalysis or particularly psychotherapy, they will speak this way about the split and mother was bad and mother was good or, and so-and-so was all bad or so-and-so was all good and so forth. They will speak this way. So we assume it had an earlier origin. Second, myths and fairy tales and stories are filled with good mothers and bad mothers. You know, there's the wicked witch and there's the very good mother and there's, you know, it's in Hansel and Gretel, it's in um, Cinderella, uh, it's in you know, story after story you find represented in these mythologies or in these folk tales, uh, an all good mother and an all bad mother uh, or female figure. And so that is one sense of it. You know, it, 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 it's children have always responded to that. They've understood it as though they they gone through this. And then the, the third piece of evidence is that us wonderful normal adults who have integrated uh, our good and bad self and good and bad others, um, under conditions of stress, we regress to splitting. Um, in war, when someone has terribly hurt you, you know, somebody has just jilted you, you immediately call up everybody who will sympathize with you and his ex-girlfriends or um, whatever. We split and you don't wanna hear anything good about the guy who just you know, jilted you. So we have splitting in adults under stress. We see it in stories for, that have been popular over the centuries for children. And even when children are in psychotherapy, when they're old enough to talk, they tend to behave this way good figures, good dolls, bad dolls, and so forth. So splitting is a problem. And it comes, this is called object relations theory. You don't need to know that, the theory that led to this overcoming and splitting. So now remember, we're not gonna deal with people who have severe or psychotic type hatred. We're dealing with the normal situation where you have interpersonal hatred with normally otherwise people who are normally functioning pretty well. Now, let's say you talk to such a person and you know that somehow or other this hatred is harming them and maybe harming the family or harming other relationships. And so, but you also know they don't wanna forgive. So what you gonna do? Huh? What you gonna do, as they say in New York City? Um, the first thing is, you, there are two things to point out. You should point out to them that hatred is a choice. You may not have chosen the fact that you hate your father or mother because as a child, you were abused by them. That's true, you didn't choose the original hatred but you now are an adult and now you can choose to keep it and keep it going and you know, feed it. Or you can say, I think I should let go of this hatred. And we're not talking about forgiveness, we're saying let go of the hatred. 
but you've already told me that letting go of hatred is possible. So why in the world should I let go of it? Well, I'd like to point out that hatred is also very costly for you. And I'll point out that the longer you continue hating, you're going to be harmed by it. So the reason to let go of the hatred, remember, we're not talking about forgiveness. We're saying you should let go of the hatred for your own good, for the benefits that will bring to you. Okay. So they say, yeah, but, you know, hatred brings me some benefits. If they're reflective. And of course, they're right. Hatred does give you short-term benefits, okay? And I'm gonna go over them because these are some of the things you have to let go of, you have to get out of your life. But at the, at the time you have them, they benefit you. What are they? Well, one benefit you have is the, uh, the joy or the pleasure of being a victim. Poor me, you can have a pity party with other people. And you can all say, well, look, you can all try to trump each other on how bad your parents were. You know, I have bad parents. You know, my father was really a bully. Oh, but mine was a drunk and a, he used to beat me up. Oh, well, mine was even worse. He was a drunk, he beat me up and sexually abused me. You know? So you try to top it. And so you have a, basically the joys of victimhood the joys of a pity party. And some people like that. And there is some pleasure in there. The second thing that you get from hatred in the short term is you get friends or social support. You don't really get friends. Friends are people who love the same thing. But social support comes from two people who hate the same thing. So you can get together and all agree that some political figure is worthy of hatred or some boyfriend is worthy of hatred or that girl that you went out with and she oh, dumped you, you know, she's worthy of hatred. Or maybe it's your mother or maybe it's your father, more likely probably your father in terms of the statistics of things. So you get social support. Third, a third benefit short term that you get is you get a feeling of energy and purpose. You know, what is it from uh, Princess Bride? Um, my name is Inez Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. You know? um, so that gives you a short term purpose. So that's a third benefit you get. You can spend your whole life cooking up revenge and revenge scenarios. And sometimes you may try to activate them. In fact, in that movie, he eventually did kill the man with six fingers who was his father's killer. But a fourth thing that comes as a benefit is you feel, and this is probably one that's really very important for most people, they feel morally superior. You feel morally superior to the person who's hurt you. They were unjust and you were an innocent victim. You are innocent, you are good, they're bad. But in any case, those are some of the short-term benefits you'll get. And you have to give them up if you're going to decide to let go of your hatred. And why should you do that? Well, there are benefits from letting go of your hatred. Um, well, one of the benefits is hatred often leads to hatred from, in response from the other person. You get into the Hatfield and McCoy problem of hating one group and they hate each other and it just spirals out of control. And what it means is you have a long-term hatred in, a, in an interpersonal sense between two groups or parts of the family or something of that kind. And that's very harmful. So hopefully that would be something you could get rid of. The other thing is it wrecks, it can wreck a, not just the relationship, of course, but can wreck a family. It's harmful to the family. 
just per se, because uh, other your siblings may like your father or one of your siblings may really enjoy being with your mother or something like that, the person that you can't stand and moved across the country from. So the point is, the harms that are coming now are very clear. Uh, family disruption, hatred that can lead to uh, them responding back to you in a hateful and harmful way, so you end up with a kind of war. And third, let's look at those so-called benefits. Do you really think a pity party, the poor me role is a very su successful role in life? I mean, all the time you spend that, you know, self-pity, scripture says this too, self-pity comes from the devil. The devil wants you to feel you're no good. God wants to feel, want you to feel good. God wants you to know he loves. The devil wants you to feel hateful about yourself. Poor me. So to be feeling the pity party um, in that you're, you're wasting your life in that mode and thinking of yourself as weak and in, inconsequential. That's why, you know, I had a, you know, I'm this, uh, you know, I'm the, the child of an abused parent. That's a way of putting yourself in a negative role that keeps you from flourishing. So you don't want, so the short-term benefit of being in a pity party is, is overridden by the long, very quickly, the long-term loss of your own life to that. And please remember that often the person who hurt you doesn't, didn't notice it at the time, or often if they did notice it has long forgotten it while you years, as years go by, are continuing to cultivate. I was once in a, in a retirement community and talking to some of the people there, and I was introduced to a woman who must have been in her early 70s. And the first thing she talked about was the insult that she had received at, at her 16th birthday from her older sister. So here she is, 50 years later or something like that, still mulling over an insult from her birthday when she was 16 that came from a sister. You know, talk about having something that, that is, has harmed her and paralyzed part of her life for all those years. And she was feeling sorry for herself. There was no doubt about it. So, um, so the pity party is runs out of positive support for you pretty quickly because it ruins your life by keeping it in a, a, in a, in a rut of self-pity and not of accomplishment. The second thing is you get social support. But I already mentioned, you know, the people, the friends that you have because you hate the same person aren't real friends. Real friends are people who love the same things and not real friends who hate the same person. You, you could find you had nothing else in common with them. You had no loves in common. All you had was you, you all agreed that so-and-so was, uh, you know, evil and bad and harmful. So they're not, the social support is not really a form of friendship. And the contrary, if you had friends, you would be in a situation where you would be talking about what you loved in common. Maybe it's baseball, maybe it's beading, maybe it's making quilts, maybe it's eating or drinking wine, whatever. Maybe it's praying. So in fact, that's a very misleading benefit, the social support. The third support, which I mentioned, was the support that comes from and the energetic purpose that comes from having a avenging uh, scenario in mind. Well, okay, that does give you some support. And we have to remember that in Princess Bride, he spent his whole life trying to find his father's killer. But when you're through with that energy and that purpose, what do you have? Even if you end up getting a fantasy solution or an actual solution by killing the guy who killed your father. You'll probably go to jail for that anyway, but we'll, we'll put that aside. But when you're through with that, all the years you've spent in vengeance, you've done nothing. And so the problem with in Princess Bride was they, couldn't, they didn't know what to do with this guy. 
after he succeeded in killing his father's murderer. So they, I think they, he had no skills, he had no purpose. So in spite of, again, the energy and purpose it gives you, it's a negative energy and a negative purpose that doesn't accomplish anything positive and leaves the years that you spend in it as wasted in terms of anything that would be flourishing for you. And finally, you tell the person, your moral superiority is kind of irritating. <laughs> Nobody likes people who are always talking about how morally better and superior they are and things of that kind. Um, it's irritating. And when you know they're angry at other people, sometimes that spills out, you know, and accidentally it hurts another person. So I think you see now that moral, that moral superiority is, uh, is, isn't really going to, in the short term, it makes you feel good. But in the long term, other people don't like people like that. And often when you have a lot of anger with it, it'll spill out on other people and accidentally harm them just because you're so infuriated at Mr. X or Mrs. Y or at your sister or at your brother. So. Let me go back over and say this. What you're trying to point out to the person is that hatred of an interpersonal kind is harmful to them. That the so-called benefits of it are short-term and, and if they go very long, they waste your life, they cause all sorts of problems of other kinds. And if you really want a constructive, thriving life, hatred holds you back from that. And so the, a reason to let go of the hatred, a reason to let go of the hatred is for your benefit. We're not talking about forgiving the other person. We're just trying to say, we want you to have a better life. And I'm sure you want to have a better life. And remember this, this hatred is burning you up. It's turning you into a kind of crisp inside. And so if you can let go of it, you can return to a normal life of, of working on love and friendship and on virtues and on flourishing in your life. All right. So then the question might arise, well, what could I do to help get rid of my hatred? I don't want to forgive that jerk, but uh, what can I do? Well, remember the real problem is splitting. You split it so that you're the good person, the victim, and the other person, that guy is the bad guy or the bad girl, whatever, but the bad person. And that's called, as I said, splitting. And you're splitting right then and there as an adult. Only in that situation, perhaps and not in others, but you are splitting there. And that really means you're saying the other person is all bad <laughs> and you're all good, okay? Now, I would like to say that if the, per if the person you're dealing with is a Christian, there's one thing you can say that's very clear. Jesus said to pray for those who persecute you, pray for your enemies, and he wasn't kidding. Because he said, if all you do, if you're nice to the people who are nice to you and hostile to the people who are bad to you, well, everybody does that. You're just ordinary pagan, ordinary pre, you know, an ordinary uh, pre Christian human, and now post Christian, and you're still just the same thing. So Jesus said you had to pray for your enemies because you can always pray for them can't always talk to them. They may be miles away or they don't wanna to talk to you, but you can always pray for them. And therefore I'm proposing that prayer is the major way you overcome splitting. Prayer is an anti-splitting process. You pray, I hope you see that. To pray for your enemies is to make them seem once you start praying for them, and you don't pray that they boil in oil, you pray that they benefit, right. okay? You pray that they benefit. 
that they be that they will be blessed. You pray that good things will happen for them. And when that happens, they cease to be all bad. All of a sudden, you remember a few good times you had with your ex-wife. Uh, I remember when we went out to the beach one time. It was really nice. I, I wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't been praying for her. And you also begin to think sometimes about, well, you know, maybe I was kind of mean sometimes with, when I was with her. And so what happens when you pray for your enemy is that the splitting slowly dissolves, maybe not completely, but a good deal. And in its dissolving, the hatred starts to go away. Now, what do you do with people who can't pray for their enemies? Because let's say they're not Christian and they, they don't. They don't buy that. Well, that's when you can say, let's be realistic about it. Uh, you don't have to pray about it, but I want you to think about them in a way that makes you come to a greater understanding of why they did this. Have you ever done anything like this to anybody else? Can you understand from their personality and from their background why this might have happened? And come to an understanding of it so that you realize that you know they're not all bad and that you know you're not all good and that there may be people that are putting you in the all bad position because of things you've done so ask them to think more about the meaning of the other person and the other person's life and the social conditions and well they were drunk at the time when they said that oh well you know or or whatever or they had just been they just lost their job no wonder the guy was angry or whatever. You know, all I'm saying, ask them to think as carefully as they can about some of the things that are, would extenuate the crime against you. Rather like you would have in a court, you'd have a, a defense lawyer for your enemy. A defense lawyer would, you know, give all the extenuating circumstances. Uh, etc. And you begin to understand the other person more. And uh, you might even, they, they, that defense lawyer might even say something nasty about you so that you would, whoops, that's true too. <laughs> and you begin to lose your all good status in your own uh, perception. And that's for people who aren't Christians we're talking about now. So then my Sort of, I've, I've gone through this pretty quickly here, and, and I want to be open now for questions and so forth. But um, when a person has let go of some of their hatred, or maybe sometimes even all of it, then the possibility of forgiveness becomes more likely. You don't leave that as hovering over them, <laughs> but when if they actually go through the the, the letting go of hatred, you will see improvement in that person. They will seem happier. They will not be so preoccupied with these short-term positive, but really long-term negative attitudes of self-pity and finding people to comfort them socially. And they wouldn't be filled with vengeance and they wouldn't seem so morally superior. And you would see a mellowing of them as this was let go and you'd mention it to them you know, you seem happier lately, or you're doing things better. Uh, you know, you're not as mad at you're not as mad at your dad as you used to be. Um, maybe that's because you're a dad now, and you know what it's like. Right. So, um, or whatever. But and you point out the benefits when you see them in their life, and that encourages them to continue. Then, at some later date, probably with some other person. Uh, the issue of forgiveness might be directly addressed. So I'm not going to go into actual models of forgiveness. I've had to do the prepping here for the problem with the hatred and uh, to, to deal with forgiveness as a process itself, you should get some of the real experts on that. Like, uh, Oh, there are a bunch of them out there. Uh, we won't mention anyone in particular, but there's some very experienced people now uh, at forgiveness. 
And, and in case you're interested, psychotherapy, probably about 20 some years ago, a little bit more perhaps, accepted forgiveness as a form of intervention in psychotherapy. And both of the major theorists, uh, Enright and Worthington, Enright is a Catholic, Worthington is a Protestant. And they came, did it about the same time. And they both introduced forgiveness as something to be used as an intervention in psychotherapy and in counseling. And it's been accepted. In fact, Enright's book was published by the, AP, by the American Psychological Association. And so his, the first edition of it. So that's a, that's a good sign for psychology. Uh, there are some bad signs too, of course, but we won't go into them. But anyway, that's what you, you, the process of forgiveness itself when somebody wants to engage in it is itself a very worthy topic but I'm just focusing on those who don't want to forgive, how you might help them to let go of hatred and, and, and implicitly prep them for later forgiveness. Okay, any questions? Okay, uh, yes, I have a few. The, okay. the Q&A section is available in the bottom of the, the Zoom uh, uh, toolbar. I see so Q&A, yeah. Yeah, so um, as the questions come in, I'll, I'll go ahead and try and pick those up and uh, I'll get us started here. One of the things, I had a whole bunch of questions, but I think you kind of answered them. But when you talked about uh, there, the virtue that comes to mind is, is justice. You talked about justice. And, it, and it's, it's like we can have justice by putting the best construction on the other individual that we can. Yes. And then coupled with that would be charity. Would be what? Charity. So for the yes. non-Christian, you, you could focus on justice. For the Christian, the hope, a hope of, of not only their own salvation, but the salvation of the other. Of the other person. Right. To see the other person as a, you are both children of God. Right. Which leads to Christian love and charity. I mean, yes. I, it just seems like that that would be... Uh, the source or the place to go, if you will. Yeah, am I right? Yes, it is. But of course, that requires genuine forgiveness. Good. And so, what I'm talking about is a prep for it, with uh, you know being reasonable and you know getting rid of the uh, letting go of some of the uh, uh, of the hatred, so that without forgiveness, but the ultimate is forgiveness because that leads to your seeing them as a, as a fellow child of God right. who is in trouble because of what they're doing to you. <laughs> okay, it looks like we had a... Um... He says, I know we weren't addressing the issue of forgiveness in those with mental illness. Do you have some suggestions or sources on the topic uh, as well as forgiveness in addiction. That's... Uh... Well, in addiction, the real, you know, basically the problem is to deal with the addiction as far as I know. Right. But other cases, you might suggest, let's say you have somebody who's mentally really disturbed. You might still suggest that they pray for the other person if they're Christian and say, Jesus asked us to do this. And see if, if they, and, and maybe you guide them in that prayer. I'm talking here now about pastoral counselors. I'm talking here about friends who could guide somebody, fellow Christian in prayer. Let's pray for, you know, for Joe Schmuck or whatever, you know, whoever, uh, let's pray for your father who, uh, was indifferent and never really loved you and then abandoned your family. Pray for him. And also point out that he's in trouble because of these things. I mean, these are things that are helping to ruin his life too. And so if you can get the person to, even if the person is 
very mentally disturbed, they might be willing to pray for them or listen to you pray for that person. Or to try to think of some of the good things of the other person. What, what good time, you know, you grew up, I, I had one patient who was very angry at her mother for many years, could hardly speak of her except with hostility. But we worked hard on this for a long time. And finally, she remembered a good time she had with her mother that she'd completely denied to her conscious experience. And the sign of it was she began to weep. She was weeping in the session because this memory of the good time with her mother had come back and was making her realize that her hostility, the remorse that was set up by seeing this good mother now, when she had just painted her all as the bad mother, was causing her to feel bad about it. And she was weeping for it. That was part of her recovery though, of a better understanding of her mother and knowing what her mother had been going through at the time. Um, other questions? Or, yeah, or yeah, thank you. That was scenarios. a good response here. The other question, another question came up, is, is what about the confronting the person who hurt you, if not alone with the help of another? Um, the reference is Matthew 18, 15. Yes. That's a possibility that you can do. And I, I certainly suggest it, but I'm that it should be done if possible. With You, you have somebody with you, of course. Right. Uh, but the problem is so many times you don't have that opportunity. You, you, you know, you've moved away from that. It's, it's the person, sometimes the person's dead. Right. And that's the time when you can still pray for them. And that's the time when you can still uh, try to recover positive recollections. But you can't confront them. And by the way, uh, Forgiven, uh, for letting go of hatred is one thing. Forgiveness is another. Reconciliation is a third thing. It's a different thing. You're not asked to reconcile with everyone. You're asked to forgive them. Mary, uh, you're, you're, you, she's got her, there you go. Paul, could you talk a little bit more about those th three things and how they're different? Those three things that I just mentioned, yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, as I said at the beginning, hatred and letting go of it, you do not have to forgive. You let go of it for your benefit to get rid of the negatives that hatred causes in your life. And I went over those, you know, the everything to messing up your family or to setting up enemies, the pitying, self-pity, the friends who aren't really friends are just socially supporting your hatred. The whole issue of um, having a vengeance purpose and what that does to your life and, and of course, moral superiority. So you point out rationally to this person, what do you want to do? Look, here's a person who's hurt you. And now your response to that is hurting you even more. You know, why give that person you hate that power, power over you? Right. That person is still controlling you or is controlling you without even you knowing it. Yeah, it would be a reclamation. And that person's probably forgotten. They, they forgot your name, <laughs> much less that you exist. <laughs> so that's hatred and that issue. The next one is forgiveness. Well, forgiveness means the actual letting go of the, of the injustice that they have and the, and, the, and the obligation they have to you because of that injustice. They have been unjust. We're all assuming these are valid. You, you were really hurt and what, you're not making this up. That's a separate problem. But yeah. most, of the, most of us have been hurt in re real life. Life is difficult. And those are one of the reasons it's difficult is people hurt you or fail in some way where they shouldn't have. And so forgiveness there is you give that up and you do pray for them explicitly and see them as like you, a child of God. And that tends to have even more positive benefits psychologically 
than just letting go of the hatred. Recon reconciliation is a third stage and it's not, scripture doesn't ask us for that. Reconciliation requires that you and that other person truly reactivate a, 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 a normal positive relationship. Now, although scripture doesn't require it, successful marriage does. <laughs> <laughs> that is you, you do have to get back to you know okay yeah we you got you got through it and one of the things about a successful marriage is not that people don't hurt each other but that the hurts are forgiven and then reconciled and that strengthens the marriage and so finally some of the things that hurt you when you were first married when the same thing occurs it's you know, it doesn't mean that much. It bounces off. I know we'll get over this, you know. And she told me which way to drive at this corner and it irritates me, but it doesn't make me really mad anymore. And besides that's the way she is. And, and, and it's her, her weaknesses there are part of her virtues that I really love elsewhere. And, uh, and besides, we'll get over it. And, and in five minutes, we'll both be just talking normally. But reconciliation is necessary for an ongoing relationship which was broken uh, to, to, to be reinstated. Beautiful. Uh, another question came in. Uh, do we ever uh, mature to the point where we don't, we don't split? Where we, where we don't what? Split, where we don't experience these splits. Um, I think that's the case in some of the saints. <laughs> we can aspire to sainthood, I guess. <laughs> I, exactly. Well, I, no, but I think the spiritual life is about that. Is about getting to the point where, you know, God doesn't split when somebody says he doesn't believe in it. Or he doesn't, you know, some people give God the finger or something like that when they think they've been hurt. It doesn't bother God and that he doesn't split. He still wants you to, he still loves you and wants you to, in some sense, prosper and flourish and become better and come closer to him. So I would say that to love God and to love your neighbor in the ultimate sense is to have overcome splitting. So if you've met somebody who has really done that, you've met somebody who has matured in the highest sense in, in both physical and spiritual sense that they're yeah oh yes they've really integrated a life and are thriving yeah and they would be they're at peace right that doesn't mean they don't have difficulties right but they're at peace and they're they're not they're not filled they don't they're not filled with condemnations of other people for example that's one of the signs that you have a fair amount of hatred you know, always condemning these bad people doing these things. You know, they're out there. <laughs> right. Um, there's a comment here. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this. The, per the author's name is Jane Hunt, and it's uh, How to Forgive When You Don't Feel Like It was one of the... Uh, perhaps what I can do is we could put together a resource on this and post it on the website and help people. Yes. Uh, I don't know that particular one, uh, in part because... I haven't, as my remarks, I hope, made clear, focused as much on forgiveness per se right. as on this other peculiar situation when people don't want to, and what can you do perhaps to help? Right. Um, yeah, actually, June Hunt, not Jane. June, I'm sorry, I misspoke. That's okay. I got it. Thank you. Uh, and the theoreticians that I know are, are, are uh, those that I mentioned. The first big, you know, Enright and Worthington, Everett Worthington. Yeah, He's yeah. a Protestant. He's written a whole bunch of works on forgiveness in various contexts. And so has uh, Enright. Good. But they've had, you know, they first began this, say, 25 years ago. And now there are many other people out there who have picked it up 
And I gather this woman, Yom, is it? June, I think is. June. Mary, June, yeah. The last name is June? No, the no, first name is June. And the, the last name is, let me see if I can find it here. Hunt. Hunt. June Hunt. Hunt okay. Yeah. I, she probably has some very good stuff. Well, we'll we'll put together some resources for people, and maybe have you back to talk about forgiveness. Oh no, get get a real expert on that. All it's, right, it's an maybe you can help important me. topic. It's an important topic. Yeah, it is. You know, the one other thing is we're running out of time, so I, I just want to throw in one other thing. A question that I had is: it seems like we've talked a lot about individuals who hurt one another, and it sounds like what you're saying is that the individual can actually develop these same kinds of feelings possibly towards an institution. Uh, they might, but I, 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 I pass on whether that, how that might happen and, and what it might mean. Um, okay. Yeah. So I leave that to how to love an institution. I don't know. Yeah. That's, but you know, when we become angry with something that's an inanimate thing, there's, it, it would be detrimental to ourselves. So it's like, you know. I think we probably figure out that's one of the reasons we're angry with an inanimate thing is not because it's inanimate, but because somebody has been behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to address it, I think. Okay, good. With institutions, it usually is, you know, oh, it's that damn CEO, or maybe it's somebody, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody in the church, whether it's the Pope or the Bishop or the pastor. And so they get angry at the church and they're really angry at something that has happened to them that they really see as interpersonally harming them from another person. Okay, good. Well, it's, uh, it's about five o'clock. Did you want to ask any other questions, Mary? Well, there's one more online and uh, it might be kind of out of the, uh, out of the realm that we're talking about tonight, but Someone said you um, you spoke about the arts at some level in your other works. Can you say anything about the hatred and splitting by artists as a group from the general population? Oh, I know it was tough. It's a big one. <laughs> look, look, that that that's a first of all, whoever posed it, that's a very interesting question. I yes. I like that kind of question. Yeah, but it's a big one. Uh, the only reason I mentioned the arts was I was. That was in, I think, in the context of uh, that book I've, I've just finished on uh, that came on complementarity in women and men. Where we'll, it was we'll be in, back. We'll, we're coming back to that one. <laughs> oh, coming back to that one. Anyway, there was a chapter on the on complementarity in, in the arts, but not on forgiveness in the arts, or not on hatred in the arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. But that's a great question. I'm going to have to. Stay awake tonight, sleeping on that one. <laughs> well, you work Trying on it, and we'll ask it next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh, you'll remember. <laughs> well, I, I might not, but I'll ask the person. Who but you'll it. ask. Maybe the person who, who, yeah, I know the person who gave who it will be there next time. And there you say, go. Dr. Fitch, you said you were going to think about this. So let <laughs> right. me hear your answer now. <laughs> so good to see you, Paul. Well, it's great to see you all. And I said we just moved into this new house, so. It's How? filled with boxes and furniture that doesn't quite fit here and did in the other place and all of that kind of thing. And and new adventures and new promises. It's filled with yes. those too, right? Yes, yes, new promises. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, that's so, awesome. Greetings to everyone in California Thank you. and in between. Thank yeah. you, Paul. Thank you. It's great to see you. Let's Adios. Go Let's go Adios. ahead and Paul, if you need to go, please do. I'm going to wrap up with a few comments uh, about the upper room gathering and close with okay. prayer, if you don't mind. So I'll, I'll, I'll disappear from your screen. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Again, Thank you so much for adios. your time. So I, I think this is, this is really, was really good for me. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and I hope that we all have a blessed Christmas and that it's full of uh, joy and uh, a sense of, family and friends for the new year. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close with prayer and uh, wrap it up. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to come together. Grant us peace, the peace that you have given us. Let us examine our hearts and let us develop a closer walk with you. Thank you, Jesus, for Paul Vitz and our attendees. 
Watch over us as we engage with our families over the coming holiday. Bless the upper room gathering with the spirit of love and truth. Be with us and watch over travelers, the sick, and those in need of hope. Help us do our work. Amen. Um, I want to again thank everybody for being here. Our, our website is open and it's public. So I, pu I published a uh, video that Paul did uh, with ETWN or EWTN uh, on his latest book. You can find the, the link to the, his YouTube there or just search Paul Bits on YouTube. And then to receive updates from our YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe. So uh, again, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Good night. <laughs>